Great. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the December session. And uh, we are starting off with our OWASP VR Women in Apps Plus InfoSec Girls uh, session. Welcome and to the December session. And uh, we are starting off with our OWASP VR Women in Apps Plus InfoSec Girls uh, session. So uh, today we have Loredana and Asta. Uh, the, uh, Loredana would be speaking on uh, IoT Shariat chapter, which is in Italy. And uh, Asta will be talking about IAM, which is Identity and Access Management. Uh, before I hand over the call to them, I want to give you a brief about what uh, OWAS Women in AppSec and InfoSec Girls is all about and what uh, what are what we are planning to have uh, in future apart from the sessions that we conduct every month. So OWASP, Women in AppSec and InfoSec Girls is a community to have more women in the information security, give them a platform uh, to speak, to interact with the global women leaders uh, who want to share their knowledge. Also, um, to make them comfortable uh, so that we can have a bigger platform for them. So right now, this platform, uh, with this platform, we do these webinars monthly. Apart from that, we do uh, trainings at conferences. Uh, also, uh, we are planning to have certain hackathons also. Uh, we will keep you posted about them. There is a new uh, conference which is coming up in February, which is OWASP Seasides. Uh, that will happen in uh, India, Goa. Uh, we, we have ruled, uh, we have shared the uh, training for women. The, the trainings are free for anyone to attend. And there is a special training for women as well. Um, I would request you, if you're coming to Goa during the same time, I would request you to join um, and uh, fill out the form so that you can be part of the training and can attend the training. The seats are limited, so please go ahead and register for it. The site is uh, owaspcsides.com. If you have any question, uh, you can actually reach out to me at my email address, which is uh, vandana.verma at owasp.org. Or you can also reach out at uh, CFP, owaspcsides at owasp.org. Uh, that's about the conference, and uh, I would share further more details once the sessions are over. And we are open for questions. If you have any question, feel free to post it, and uh, we'll be able to answer it for you. Now I will uh, uh, transfer the call to Loredana. Loredana, over to you. Thank you very much, and thank you, everybody, for joining this uh, meetup and this webinar. Uh, just uh, a question. You will put the slides, uh, Vandana? Or yes, I will just put, put, okay, I'll great. Just put the slides. Okay, great. So, uh, I, uh, as I said, I thank everybody. And uh, what I'm going to speak uh, today is um, a project that is called the Chariot, that you can see it's. Uh, you know, an acronym for Cognitive Heterogeneous Architecture for Industrial IoT. I think uh, it is important, and this is on the second slide, that I give you the um, what Chariot is, in order to better understand also where it focuses and uh, what is the aim behind this uh, type of project. Chariot is a project that is a research project that is financed under the Horizon 2020 financing program for research for the, from the European community. This is something uh, uh, I think uh, very important because it's something that I mm, do like to share with you. Uh, as if uh, any of you has contact with uh, um, a, a, a European companies or companies that have subsidiary in Europe or with the universities you know that are present in Europe this can be an interesting area where to do research and to work because this specific program Horizon 2020 and there are many others uh, from the European community, they give a financing to proposal, research proposal coming from a European university, research center, and uh, industry companies. 
So it's a, a way that the European Commission gives the opportunity to this type of reality to do research, giving them you know, a part of the finance. Uh, as you can see from uh, the, this slide, the funding and uh, also how long this project will last. It also started the uh, uh, beginning of this year. Uh, this is a three years uh, project. So uh, during my presentation, you will see some of the goals and the activities going on in this project and uh, not or let's say uh, the results because it's still ongoing uh, and there are also some uh, um, outputs that are under NDA so they cannot be completely uh, presented in a, an open presentation like this but I will give some hints at the end to show you how you can if you want uh, be informed and participate in this slide, you see who are the participants in the project. And as you can see, there are uh, companies and uh, belonging to a uh, university belonging to the different uh, area. And there are also uh, what is called within this type of project users that are companies that will exercise the results of the project in order to give evidence of what uh, you know is, uh, is done. So, which is, uh, uh, this is slide five, which is the focus of uh, this project? This project started from what is called, uh, you know, a challenge. We, everybody knows, more or less, you know, either from a real user perspective or from a research perspective or from a developers and uh, technology providers that uh, Internet of Things is becoming something that is growing, you know, and... Uh, Behind this keyword, you can see many things. You can see the solution coming from the um, end users. You know, we speak about uh, things also that we use within our house, or in particular, things that are used in uh, uh, industrial environment. This project wants to deal with this area, that is the uh, uh, object that can control and can manage and can you know, give uh, information in the industry area and uh, he, there you can see everything you know you can have uh, lights uh, or heater system within uh, a factory you can have physical security system within a campus you can have uh, for example as one of the um, user that participate to this project that is a railway company uh, uh, you can control the devices that controls the train really you know how you you manage uh, the different parts of a train which is uh, as you can imagine something quite quite important in fact the chariot project wants to deal not only with the security in iot environment but also with safety because sometimes this type of devices on board of a train or a campus or whatever can also be a problem for life. And another aspect that is strongly emerging in this area is also connected with privacy, because collecting many data from the different devices that you can put you know, in the network, on the campus and so on, can really, you can really gather information also on people, on uh, you know aspects that are connected with uh, let's imagine uh, something in a hospital or something like this so it's important to think and to look at this type of techno technology from different perspectives that is security of course but it's also safety and it's also privacy and the chariot project wants really to reach this in fact if we go in slide the six we see that there are lots of, uh, you know, um, uh, attacks that we heard on the on the newspaper, on the research, on the, on the different type of information coming uh, in, through this type of channel. I don't want to speak with the, uh, let's say, most famous one that uh, most of us knows. 
that are, you know, the one connected with the television and the video camera, or the one connected with the doll that was, uh, you know, connected and so on. But I'm thinking more for healthcare, transportation, smart cities. You know, I'm thinking about this type of things that are not marketing or things that just go on the newspaper. These are things that are in every, uh, you know, day life and are also strongly connected with the um, technology that are being developed. So if we go to slide uh, seven, uh, now we will see which are the objectives of this project uh, that are uh, you know, um, presented in uh, uh, slide eight. So Chariots wants to uh, focus on safety critical systems, which means uh, systems that uh, can really impact uh, also the life uh, of people. As I was telling you, the users, so the, the companies that will uh, start using uh, this platform will are uh, a railway uh, um, company, an airport in uh, Greece, the railway company is in Italy, the airport is in Greece, and an industry campus that, campus that is in Ireland. So as you can understand, our aspect is really connected with people doing things or, you know, and having information, sharing information. And so uh, those systems that can really impact the life of someone or also the environment, you know, because if you look at some uh, aspect connected also with the uh, transportation, they can also, you know, give a, a strong uh, heat to the environment if we look at the, uh, you know, um, gas that can be lost and this kind of things. So uh, there, this is uh, a quite important. And uh, I saw um, some uh, very interesting uh, presentation also for, during the last uh, meetup we had, and also uh, coming uh, in OWASP that has a specific working group on IoT. So there are areas where it's, it's uh, let's say, research guidelines, uh, standards are moving. For example, there is a, an interesting uh, uh, activities that wants to create a standard for the interoperability of the different uh, devices, you know, objects that can be developed from different uh, technology producers. Another aspect that I think is quite important for uh, OWASP and for the goals, so let's say, that OWASP has is also the software on board of these devices. Uh, in the past, uh, the network using uh, this type of solutions were very close. Generally, almost never connected with the normal uh, networks, or you know, to internet, or you know, controlled uh, from a central point of view. Now, this is no more like this, and uh, these objects are becoming more and more intelligent. So this is why someone started to call them uh, no more Internet of Things, but intelligence of things. Because on board you can have uh, information uh, that, uh, and software that manages them. So also the possibility to check, uh, you know, from a security perspective, uh, this type of software and develop and have guidelines to develop a secure software in these devices, uh, it's uh, really a key point for people doing develop, developing, uh, developing on the um, development on this type of, you know, of, of environment that is a little bit uh, different from the one that generally we, we see going on you know, for application or services in internet. I say this because uh, it's difficult to compare non -so, something like that is an online banking system or, or you know, even uh, uh, services uh, that we have with Google, all these kind of things, so with something that generally is implemented in small devices, uh, sometimes very um, done for specific needs and so on. So it's really important to look at this, uh, you know, in, in, to look at this area. As uh, uh, I was selling, telling you before, so the objectives of the project are, you know, 
at the end of the three years, with steps, of course, so with a defined plan, the idea is to develop a framework to define and operate a, a safe IoT application. So uh, looking at this, to develop an architecture and a platform, so a real platform that will be able to manage this aspect on, for safety critical system on top of the uh, IoT uh, environment. So there will be a possibility, you know, to interact uh, for the different uh, devices, but uh, uh, exchanging data and moving, uh, of course, with uh, a particular attention to privacy, security and safety. So there will be this engine that will help in controlling this. That is not the control of how these devices work, but how you can protect the environment where the, these devices are. Of course, as I told you before, they will be tested in a real industrial environment. So an airport, Trenitalia is a transportation and a, a campus. And of course, there are already starting some dissemination, exploitation activities that I will also speak to you a little bit later. So if we go now to slide the 10, you can see here, let's say, that the, a very high-level architecture. As I told you, uh, the project, uh, you know, is at the beginning. So we are now at the uh, requirements phase, uh, definition of the architecture, uh, selection of the standards to follow. So it's uh, this is why, you know, this um, um, slide doesn't go too deep in the different uh, areas, but just gives you an idea of how this platform will be built. And you can see here, you know, the where the Chaiot Open IoT platform will be. The, the uh, IPSE, that is the Privacy, Security, and Safety supervised or Supervision Engine, and uh, how they will uh, connect uh, with the different uh, sensor devices, gateway, coming from the network and coming from the market. So the idea of this pr uh, project is to be the, uh, the platform to protect the, the different uh, uh, network, not to develop specific uh, um, products, okay? So this is uh, uh, how it will work and how it will be, uh, it will be developed. Of course, uh, there are some uh, uh, activities going on uh, in this area to uh, be sure that uh, the platform will be able to connect uh, with different environment, with different uh, um, products, uh, uh, because uh, as you can imagine, uh, you know, uh, this is uh, an area that is evolving uh, uh, very fast. Uh, and therefore, uh, there is not already an existing uh, final standard or an existing set of uh, sensors and devices that uh, are already leading the market. There are many producers that are moving fast, uh, but it's not easy. As you can see here, there are a few um, basic uh, decisions already taken into account. Uh, one is the safe, safety supervision engine that will have to monitor the system and also to give prediction on possible uh, problems that could impact the, uh, the system where the different devices are installed and so on. The security engine that will also create uh, a specific uh, um, a solution also integrated, uh, let's say, with an a hardware to check the, firm, the security integrity of the fir firmware on board of the devices. So this is an area quite important, you know, as I was saying before, also connected with OWASP. And of course, the privacy engine, where uh, the solution based on blockchain are going to be analyzed and investigated in, all, in order to be able to have, uh, let's say, the, the privacy protected from this type of uh, uh, approach 
and not from uh, let's say an external uh, entity or you know someone that will guarantee for, for the data uh, transfer from the, the different area this is important because uh, as uh, uh, when we speak about IOT and sorry for coming back on this but uh, I think uh, there are some uh, areas that are easier and some areas that are not, not easier to, to do, but easier sometimes to think about. Uh, when you think about IoT, you think for sure about security, okay? Generally, security on how these uh, uh, devices and sensors are connected, then about the software. You think about the safety because you th you think uh, about where they are used, you know, so they, they can create problems, uh, you know, if you use them uh, for, you know, electricity or you use them for healthcare or you use them for buildings and so on. Privacy, it's uh, something that it's not the first thing that comes, you know, arise uh, when you think about IoT in um, safety critical environment. But this is uh, something quite important, of course, for the new rules that uh, came uh, in Europe, but that slowly are moving uh, uh, in all the countries because of the you know, market needs. But also because uh, with this type of device, you really, at the end of the day, will permeate, will be present everywhere. So there will be lots and lots of data that will be collected and that can give information on the life, uh, behavior, and so on uh, of, uh, let's say, ev everybody. There are some uh, devices that are being uh, uh, tested, uh, for example, in a uh, uh, railway station environment for how people move, uh, uh, what they do and so on. So it, there are really areas that are important, uh, let's say, to, to investigate. Uh, uh, now, if we go to slide 11, here it's uh, an area where I would really um, ask you to, you know, to, to see uh, if you are uh, in this area, because uh, first of all, there is the link to the website of the project. So you can look at it and have uh, you know an idea what is going on, which are the, the, there are already some documents that are public, some others will come and so on. I there will be also the possibility uh, to uh, subscribe to a newsletter so they have the information on the evolution of the project uh, and uh, the different outputs and test activities that will be done. There is also an area where I would really welcome uh, uh, the imp your input, uh, that is the forum. The forum, I do not know, uh, you know, I don't have now the possibility to, to, to link on it, but it's uh, uh, something that it's quite interesting because it's where all the people uh, interested in this type of in um, environment will have the possibility to interact, to discuss, to share ideas, to see results of the project, but also results coming from other initiatives and so on. So here, any input from you or request or need or whatever you think uh, um, would like to share with the people uh, and the partners of the project will be really welcome. And also, as I told you, um, all the documents and all the discussion will be uh, made public there. The, another link that you can find in the, in the site of the project that I think can be also useful for people interested in IoT area is the um, link to the, all the other related projects that are financed within the European community in this area. So you will see that there are other projects that are doing different things in IoT, but that will work, uh, let's say, in a um, coordinated manner, will work together to reach results uh, uh, all together. That can be really interesting because uh, some of them, uh, you know, address different aspects uh, within IoT. As I told you, this chariot is on 
privacy, safety, and security, we rather are more on architecture, some other on standards, some other on uh, development of specific uh, products, and so on. So if you're interested in this area, uh, feel free you know, to, 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 to check and to subscribe to the newsletter forum. And there is also, of course, all the uh, connection to the project uh, uh, participants, and you can ask uh, whatever you need. And I, of course, am here for future needs. Thank you, everybody, for this, uh, the time uh, you share with me. And feel free to ask uh, any question. Thank, Thank you, Let me check if we have any questions. Can you hear me? I do. OK, sure. Just let me check if there are any questions uh, for you. OK. Let me see. Uh, Loredana, there is a question that uh, they want to know. Uh, there is a forum, there is a newsletter, but how can they in get involved uh, in the Sharia chapter? And uh, are you uh, a chapter leader for the uh, this particular chapter, Sharia chapter? Okay, so this is not, not a chapter, it's a project. So I just... Uh, to give you this is a uh, yes of course they can be involved through the forum so if they subscribe to the forum they will be part of the community that will start you know will discuss and will share information on this mm -hmm. i have also in mind uh, but this is something that we will have uh, let's say as i told you the project is still at the beginning so the, the idea is also to have some uh, external, uh, you know, advice or comments uh, and so on the project. So probably, you know, if uh, people interested uh, participate to the forum, they will also see when uh, this will happen and uh, how uh, we can interact more. Uh, again, uh, the forum is really open for discussion. So it's a way uh, where people can uh, put questions, can uh, also public some uh, ideas, information, and so on. And it, the forum is open to everybody, not only to the project people. Mm -hmm. So also what is public there will be seen also from other community, you know. So uh, if there is someone that wants to uh, participate uh, and to discuss and to get input on something, mm -hmm. uh, that, that is the real uh, area where to start. OK, sure. Thank you so much. Uh, I think these are the questions that we have for now. Uh, I will keep you posted for more questions. Thank you, everybody, again for this opportunity. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, now, I will uh, request Asta to get started with her session. And uh, could you also please introduce yourself? Um, yes. Um, hi, everyone. Um, this is Asta. And uh, I am from OWASP Infosec Girls, Delhi chapter lead here today. I'm here to present an introductory session on identity and access management. And uh, before starting off with the session, I would like to give a brief introduction about myself. Uh, I am into InfoSec area since past four years. I have done my master's in information security management and post that from the past two years, I am into identity and access management. And uh, let's uh, go getting with the session now. Uh, so um, I would like to just start the session now. Uh, Vandana, uh, 
the slides for the session. Uh, you can also share your screen. There is okay. a green icon on the left hand side. You would be able to share your screen. Yeah, sure. Is it visible? Uh, yes, that's visible. Okay, so let's start up with the session. Uh, so basically, my main agenda with uh, coming up with identity and access management today was basically that uh, we hear all of us here who are aware of OWASP and Info InfoSec girls. Basically, we are into information security. Uh, we do have knowledge about all different areas of pen testing and uh, ethical hacking and cloud security and everything around. But I think somehow I felt that identity and access management uh, is one area which is quite active in our uh, corporate and security world, but still it is very much less talked about. So uh, let's start with an introductory uh, session where I'll be introduct uh, I'll be introducing you people with the introduction concepts, the basic concepts of I am and how currently I'm working in with uh, with the same area. So before starting off, uh, let me start with what actually is identity and access management. Basically, what we are doing in identity and access management. So it's like base, uh, when we are in a digital world, uh, either when we are either as an employee or as a normal user or a person, we are somewhere associated with some kind of organization or uh, some kind of uh, community where we are part as an individual. And for example, even if you are part of some bank, you have an account in your bank, you are a unique identity to that particular organization. So similarly, when you're working in an organization, you are a unique employee for your organization. So when we are coming to identity and access management, basically we are bringing users into a digital world as unique identity, and we are managing their resources access through an identity and access framework. So uh, with the session, as we will proceed, we will be learning that how an identity and access framework works. And when we are able to understand the basic concepts behind the identity and access framework, then I'll let you introduce to one of the tool on which I am working right now. OK, so uh, before starting up with identity and access management terms, there are few terms which through which we should be quite associated with. Since if we do not know these terms, it would be difficult for us to understand the access framework. So first of all, I already told you people that what an identity is. An identity is a unique user in a digital world whose access is managed by a unique identity access network. Coming on to the next term, which you can see in your slide, is, an, is entitlements. Entitlement is basically referred to uh, the access in, in our general term, what we call an access or resources is what we technically called as uh, entitlement in identity and access management domain. OK, the next term is account. When we are part of an organization, we have an account there. For example, you have your employee ID. Through your employee ID, you are somewhat associated with that organization. So what does account term implies that is that once you are part of an organization, you are associated with it through certain identity uh, unique criteria. So once you are part of it, you have an account on that particular organization. The next term we come up here with is scope. When we are talking about scope, you very much have an idea that scope defines a boundary. So when we are talking in terms of identity and access management, what we are talking about is how, what is the scope for a per particular organization? What is the scope of a particular resource a user has access to? So kind of a boundary what we have for resources is scope. Next term, what we refer to is, is work groups. So what are actually work groups in identity and access uh, management domains are basically special kind of users in an identity access framework who have special capability to perform certain functions. For example, uh, you are belonging to an organization whose identity and access management is uh, actually managed by a access framework. So in any of the case, uh, for example, we have any kind of requests related, any kind of pending uh, work is related. So those special capabilities will be given to those work group members and those will be managing those particular special work items which will be assigned to them. I know it may be sounding quite technical to you right now, but as we will move further with the slides, the things would be much more clearer to you people. 
okay the next term associated with the access management framework is workflows okay for example you join an organization you become part of an organization so you get certain amount of rights before joining an organization you don't know anything about organization but when you join an organization you get an id card you you actually get a physical access to enter various uh, resources in your particular organization you have access to various groups when you log in through the network so those particular accesses which have been given to you are part of a workflow for example as soon as uh, it is given uh, a, na a name of you is given to the organization that so and so person is joining an organization that there is a workflow in the background that is a business process flowing in the background that for example once you join an organization these are the birth rights which would be given to you and I'd, uh, a user id would be given to you a certain amount of read access would be given to you so that is what is referred to as workflow flows okay the next term associated with i am is roles when we are talking about roles it's like when we are working we are given a tag we are tagged as a role for example you are working as a developer you are working as a tester and you are working as a clerk in an organization so whatever role you are having in an organization according to it resources or accesses have been assigned to you so roles are basically a bunch of entitlement entitlement when i talk about the term entitlement it is referred to as a discrete level access which a user can have for example uh, a read access you want so that read particular read word is an entitlement a discrete level of entitlement discrete level of access but when i'm talking about role so it's it's a bunch of entitlement for example a person is being attacked uh, to a role of developer and a developer should have read write and execute access so all these three particular entitlement or accesses will be given to that particular role of developer so when we are talking about the term of role we are actually talking about a bunch of entitlements okay okay moving forward we have the next particular term which is known as reconciliation when we work in identity and access management framework what happens is we are managing access of users belonging to a particular organization and when we are managing access sometimes it happens that for example uh, what we are uh, okay let's come back to the basic idea what we are doing is we are managing the access of a particular organization by using our own identity and access framework so when we are doing this thing to our framework we are making changes through our framework for example uh, there is an organization abc and for that particular organization i have to onboard a user in that organization through my identity and access framework so what the tool will do it will add on the user onboard the user into the uh, organization and grant access to that user in the organization through this identity and access framework so when this process will happen sometime it may happen like that that when an identity and access framework uh, access grant has been approved it may have not been granted to the user at an organizational level see there are two different things when we are working with identity and access management one is the framework who is managing the identity and other is actually the organization whose access we are managing so changes have to be happened on both the sides for example i'm uh, i'm adding a user on my identity and access framework who manages the organization's users so if i'm granting access through my identity and access uh, management framework it should reflect to the target source of organization also so reconciliation is the term which can show us for example a, uh, for example an access request has been raised for a particular identity it uh, may have been approved it may have been pending or it may have been denied so just to get the whole picture of all the accesses in my identity and access framework we get a report through reconciliation process the second last term we'll talk about today is provisioning uh, provisioning is actually the term which i was explaining to you just before whatever changes i make to an identity and access framework those changes should be reflected in the organization as well because see the very basic funda when we are talking about identity and access management is we are managing access for an organization through some framework we are trying to manage access not manually 
but technologically automatically so whatever changes we are trying to make through that particular identity and access management tool it should be reflected in the database of organization as well for example uh, george is a particular identity or an employee to an abc organization when i'm removing george through my identity and access framework through some access request for example um, uh, uh the particular boss the boss who is bo uh, uh, george um, is an employee to a particular person tom and tom requested for a revoke access for george that he is leaving the organization so when a revoke request is raised for george in our I, uh, identity and access management framework that particular revoke request will process and that particular process will not only reflect the changes in the iam network uh, in my iam framework but it will automatically provision the changes in the organization database as well so provisioning is actually referred to as uh, uh, making changes to the target data application also through identity and access management framework okay we'll talk about integration services later we'll start with the uh, basic understanding of what identity how identity management works which i was talking to you earlier now we can refer to the slide as well so what we can do in identity and access management is that Basically, I told you that identity in a digital world is a unique user. Each identity has an account on an application to which it is onboarded. The third point is each identity has a right to request for access. Okay. For example, we are onboarding certain users of an organization to our identity and access management framework. When we have onboarded those users into our identity and access management framework, they can request for the resources we can raise an access request for the resources through the framework only for example a user requires a read access for a particular uh, uh, organization to which he or she is part of so what that particular uh, identity will do is it will raise an access through an identity and access framework and that uh, access uh, that uh, that access request will be raised processed and automatically provisioned in the target resource as well so what happens is for example whenever a user or identity raises a access in an im framework we has we have an approver also and that approver can be the immediate supervisor as well for example uh, i have raised a request for a right access for a particular application so what when the access request will be raised that access request will be approved by a approver who is assigned in that particular identity and access management framework so it works one on one this way is like for example we have onboarded users for a particular application those user can request access for various resources on that particular application and those particular access request will be approved by a certain approver okay so this is the one on one basic concept what else we can do with identity and access management framework is like is roster reviews or what we call as certifications so what happens in roster reviews and certification is uh there is a list of users we have to review their access after a certain period of time why it is required for example by mistake we forget to revoke access for a particular user we uh, by mistake the organization uh, fail to check or fail to remove certain user access which is not needed by the user now so what we will do by certification or roster review is by monthly or quarterly or annually we can review the users for a particular organization and check that if the access being assigned to them is correct or not if it is correct then during the certification that particular access will be approved by the supervisor or approver or if it is not correct and it is uh, not authentic and authorized that access will be revoked by the uh, approver the next particular feature of identity and access management framework is auditing and reporting so what happens is 
there will uh, an identity and access management framework is not only managing a single particular organization user it is managing a bulk or a lot of users who are belonging to different different applications and those application would be certainly an organization or certain or or a web application or any kind of uh, uh, organization or particular resource to which a particular user requires access so what auditing and reporting does is we can uh, generate audit trails for example a user has raised a request uh, if it was uh, we want to check at a certain period of time the user has come up or request the im uh, has requested that i raised the access for so and so resource and I, and it has not been approved is there any kind of error in it so any kind of error can be checked through audit trail what whenever a request is raised access request is raised or whatever functioning is happening at the back end of the identity and access management framework we can check through the audit logs and we can check that what has happened at the back end the last term is provisioning and deprovisioning provisioning and deprovisioning is basically refers to as i told you is is performed as a part of granting or revoking access in a target system through im mechanism for example i have granted a read access to a particular identity in my uh, in my identity and access framework so there is a background mechanism that once the access for that identity has been approved there is a background process which connects with the target organization as well and will reflect the changes there as well automatically not manually it's not like that i have uh, there are see there are both terms um whenever an access is approved at an identity and access management framework that access uh, that particular access request has to be uh, reflected at the organizational database as well for example i have given a right access to a particular user it should be reflected at their database as well so when this process will happen this process nowadays is happening automatically what we do is like for example we have provided access to a particular user through our im framework and once the access has been approved and given to the user at the im level what happen is that the identity and access management framework will connect with the database of the organization as well from the background and will reflect the changes there also so our manual effort is also minimized through automatic provisioning the next we come up with some of the components of identity and access management okay these some of the components is i have told you what functions we have performed basically uh, uh, we can uh, what functions identity and access management perform is like assigning roles and entitlements to the identities managing of boarding of uh, employees or users by uh, by the work process of workflows and providing the capability to approve revoke review and certify entitlements or roles assigned to users so these are basically what functions we are performing through an im framework okay so the next slide deals with how we are governing the access also uh, nowadays it's like identity and access management is not just we are managing access we are actually governing we are managing the risk related to identity also because what we really need to understand at a ground level is that that a particular identity to an organization is security even if one of the employees has a loophole in their the in their accesses or the resources for example any clerk could have a high level access and unknowingly that particular person can perform undue theft and can perform undue malicious action which can reflect at an organization and it, and, and it can um, imply and affect their an organization uh, reputation also so the next thing which we are going to discuss is that how identity and access management works in an im framework uh, step by step this is what i have already told you we'll just move the slide and read the steps now once uh, so so let's start once an identity is onboarded into an im system it has an account on the application to which its access needs to be managed entitlements are present in an im framework through the process of direct or indirect aggregation okay 
So what happens is when we are onboarding a particular application that is an organization's data into our IAM framework, how do we get that data? So what is happening is that we can get the data of an organization in two ways. Either, for example, an organization has an SQL database or an organization has a JDBC database or any kind of database whose connection details we can uh, through their connection details, we can directly connect to the database and aggregate the data into an IAM framework. This is one thing. Second thing is an indirect way of aggregation. Indirect way of aggregation is something which we can discuss in our next future sessions, not now. Next is um, what I've told you that when an identity raises an access request for a particular entitlement, for a particular access, which is approved by their supervisor or approver. After that, once a request is raised in our IAM framework, we have a provisioning plan. What, what do we call as a provisioning plan is that once a request is raised, it has to be approved by an approver in, on the IAM network. Once it has been approved, then that particular approved access will go to a background process where through which we'll be connecting to an organization's database, make the changes to the database as well, which is known as provisioning. Okay, once, uh, okay fine, once it is done, <clears throat> Uh, we are good to go with the aggregation and uh, I think we are clear with the provisioning process also. We can move further. This is something you can read also later. Okay, next thing which I wanted to discuss was roles and rules. We have uh, roles in our IAM framework, which I which I've already told you that a roles is a bunch of entitlements, and there are different type of roles. Different type of roles. By that I mean there can be organizational roles. There can be roles at IT level of an organization. So we can name roles with different name in an IAM framework. Okay, roles have in inheritance property also. For example, uh, a role one has two kind of access, read and write. And a role two has, has again, uh, has three kind of access, read, write and execute. So role two is actually inheriting the property of role one and then execute, uh, then using the third type of the additional access that is execute also. So roles in an identity and access framework, they work with inheritance property also. And they are basically bunch of entitlement. The, the use of roles basically in an IAM framework is to make our work easier. For example, a user, a user wants to request for an, uh, for an entitlement or what we call access, for example, read access and write access. So what a user will do if we do not have roles, that particular user will raise a request for read and then that particular particular user will re, uh, will raise a request for write so to make it easier what we can do is we can club them together and make it a role one so if a user wants these two particular accesses so a user can directly uh, request for a role one so that is the use of roles now coming back to rules what are rules okay an identity and access management framework uh, provides us a very uh, basic level of functioning of that we are onboarding an application, getting the users, managing their access, aggregating their data, that is getting their data from the organization or provisioning the changes once they are made it to the IAM framework as well. But for example, there is a business um, there is a business requirement that a particular access has to be provisioned uh, using some business logic or an additional requirement for example uh, i'll tell you a user raises a request for a particular resource a read access for a particular resource so we uh, and that particular organization has an additional business requirement that once a particular user raises a request for a read access for this, but uh, for a particular ac uh, read access, for example, they raises a request for a read access. So it should be checked that that a person should know French. For example, that access require read access require knowledge of French. So rules are basically a logic we are which we are putting additional into our IAM framework just to fulfill a business requirement. 
additional business requirement this is something which is uh, not out of the box provided by an iim framework it is something which is additional and we can add this particular thing for example once a user has raised an access request uh, a read access request for that particular entitlement so there will be a form which would which will pop up at that particular time that do you know do you uh, know french if that particular user say uh, clicks on yes then only the that particular request will go for approval and then provisioning if no then it would be automatically revoked and that access request will not be implemented further so basically rules are a logic which we can implement uh, for example the tool which i use we we work on java so when we have to write rules we uh, we write using java bean shell programming and there can be there are different types of iim uh, iim tools frameworks they are out in the market which are using different different programming languages at their back end so we can uh, work on rules according to that particular iim framework okay the next is aggregation and provisioning which uh, we have already dealt with so you can go on uh, reading that later also we'll move to the next slide we have discussed certification also which i have told you people that certification is like an access review we are checking that these particular amount of users they have these particular accesses is it is it correct or not we, uh, their accesses is correct or not it's it's just a check for example you give an exam so that particular test uh, that particular test copies are just checked by a sort of uh, checked by a supervisor and certification is similar to that coming on to the end of our slide uh, sale point is the identity and access management tool by gartner it's so uh, uh, very much famous and uh, i'm currently working on out of these three major solutions i'm working on sale point identity iq on which we are managing applications which are on premises basically sale point is a tool uh from its 7.2 version it provides an open identity management platform and what sale point is doing is the basic architecture of sale point is like whatever changes you are making to this particular iim framework those changes are directly provisioned and directly aggregated without any manual effort so whatever access request is raised by a user that particular access request once approved on sale point identity iq the user has gained access to that particular uh, access on uh, identity iq that particular grant access will be automatically provisioned to the target application as well so sale point works on java uh, on a object based approach and uh, it has three major solutions provided uh, to uh, how you want to manage access for example identity iq works on on premises uh, on on premises applications identity now based on cloud based application those are uh, applications which are on cloud and their user has to be managed and the third one is security iq security iq is basically used to manage access to data we are uh, in security iq what we are doing is uh, we are managing documents and whose access should be on documents whose access should not be in the documents so these are the three main areas and sale point is one of the finest tools uh, working on identity iq so i hope Uh, you people have got a little bit clearance on i am i'll be taking more sessions in future i hope to take more sessions as well so that you people can get more clarity on identity and access management i know some of the terms may have been sound very much technical and may have not been quite clear to you right now but i promise to you that with the more sessions i'll take in future those particular terms will be more clearer to you so yeah I'm done with the session. Great, thank you, Asta. Thank you, Vandana. So, uh, I you can actually provide the link uh, for your slide deck so that they can have a look at it. Uh, if you can share your uh, Twitter handle or any other details with the participants so that they can reach out to you. Uh, okay, sure. For any queries, uh, you can reach me to my email ID: double a s t h a asta s a h n i sahani nine. 
at the rate gmail.com and uh, i will share the link details for the slides as well with you people so that you can refer to the slides as well and i can take up your queries also and we can follow up on that also oh great thank you thank you um, so while we are waiting for the questions to come uh i want to emphasize again that uh, we have a training at owasp seasides on um, february so the trainings are basically on 27th and 28th february uh, the women's training the women hands on penetration testing training is on 28th of uh, february uh, the registration is live and it's free of cost there's no charge we are also looking for volunteers to help us and if you want to get uh, if you want to learn from the training please go ahead and take a look at the site there's a facebook page twitter handle and the registration form is live um you can share it with your friends or the people who are coming to go and want to attend the session please go ahead and uh, pass the information that's why we wanted to release uh, on this particular platform uh, apart from that um we are uh, planning to have certain online trainings which we will keep you posted about and we would require more participation from the women so that we multiple women can give the session or the trainings uh we have uh, we have given certain trainings in the past for uh, uh, st cloud university minnesota uh, that was a 4 hour long session and it went on really well i and namrata were there so we uh, both trained uh, st cloud university students they were like uh, uh, close to 100 plus students who were actually there on the session it was a hands on session then um, apart from that we also gave a training to uh as a part of uh, was women in apsec and for sec girls uh, to university of egypt uh, girls those are cairo women and there is a, a hackathon or a ctf which is going to happen on december 15th so uh, you can take a look at that also the training is also live which was recorded and uh, shared across uh you can take a look at the infosec girls twitter handle and ovas women in apsec twitter handle the information is out there if you think that uh, you are looking for a training in any college or uh, um a hands on penetration testing training in any of the areas uh, around india or outside please feel free to reach out to us we are uh, uh, available you have uh, you can uh, just drop a note uh, on the twitter or you have we have our email addresses listed on the ovas oh, women and appsec wiki feel free to reach out we are very much reachable and try and help more and more women to get engaged um so for today i have this information for you if you require any further information feel free to drop a note to us uh we just want to make sure that we grow and have more women speaking up to the global uh, uh global platform so thank you so much uh, for today uh we will stay tuned for the next session which will be in uh, uh, january second saturday and uh, you will get the speaker details shortly and also yes another important update we are giving a training at apsec california in january um please go ahead and register for that uh, it's going to be on um, it's going to be in la which is an amazing place uh, in california so the training will be on the beach or near the beach i would say it's a beautiful place so please go ahead and register for it um and um, all the trainings we will keep you posted we would require your help so that we all can go ahead and provide the trainings and the sessions to the wider audience so thank you for today